Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, to all of you in Perme the Permian Basin and maybe uh, across the country. Uh, welcome to the Sewell Leadership event. Even though it is live stream instead of live and in color, uh, we welcome you to a great hour and a half that we're going to spend with John Maxwell, Mark Cole, and myself. Really an opportunity uh, for all of us in our communities and across this world to, to have an opportunity to understand what it looks like not just to lead ourselves really well, but what we can learn to be able to really lead our families, our companies, our organizations, and our entire community really well during unprecedented times in many ways regarding a virus that we're learning how to fight and learning how to protect ourselves from. But also for those of us in the Permian Basin, a fight that we're unfortunately very used to. Uh, the reality is that West Texas can be really tough at times, but the best reality is that West Texans are tougher than anything that we've ever faced. And so while we fight the coronavirus on one front, we also fight uh, the reality of oil and gas prices that have been unprecedented for us in the last decade. And so today, I hope that uh, you'll take time to really be able to learn from John this morning, uh, to be able to answer questions that you may have. You're going to be able to send them in to us, and we're going to try to volley as many of those questions as we can to John and to Mark. But the thing that I hope that you leave with after the next 90 minutes is the understanding that you and I have a responsibility to lead with great faith all the people around us. That in spite of all the fears that we may have ourselves or the things that we may know or be rumored to understand that every day you and I have to choose faith over fear. We have to believe that tomorrow really will be better than it is today. And with that said, John, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for taking of your time. I guess the good news is we all have a lot of free time. Yeah, um, and uh, with that said, um, thank you. Uh, you have mentored me not only from a distance for the last two decades, uh, but incredibly close. And I consider you a friend yep. and a father. Yep. And I thank you very much. So um, we're ready to learn from you. Thank you very thank much. You. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Colin. And uh, to all my friends in the uh, Midland Odessa area, I, I just want to say hi. I'm glad I'm with you. If, if I could have been able to come to the event, as I have the previous years, this would have been our 14th year. Uh, and every year when I look at my speaking calendar, uh, about this time of the year, I, I always smile when I see Odessa because I realize that, that we've become family, that I've been able to come into your life and speak into your life. You've been able to speak into my life that we've been learning and growing together for a long time. And yet I kind of guess today, even though I'm not with you physically in proximity, I, I have a guess that this may be uh, your greatest growing time we've ever spent together. Because during the crisis, during a very difficult time, what happens is uh, our learning curve goes up. When we really want to uh, make the best of ourselves and the best for our families and the best of the crisis, uh, we get on a, a, a real teachable spirit train. And so I, I'm just delighted. I'm delighted to be here even in spite of the situation, the crisis. And I want to say to you again how much Colin uh, loves the community and, and loves the West Texas area. And uh, he's just invested so much, not not only in his own family being there, but he invests so much in you and, and me, and, and he just wants everything to be lifted in, in, in your area. And I'm just, I'm so grateful. He's a terrific leader. He's a wonderful friend. I've had the privilege of mentoring. My gosh, Colin, I've mentored you for 20 years now. I mean, since he was almost a baby. And uh, it's just been a, a delight to have this relationship with him. And so when it was impossible, obviously, for us to pull off the event, uh, immediately, Mark and I said, "Well, of course, we'll 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 do this. We'll we'll do anything we can to be with you and serve you." And I'm just glad to, to have this time. Colin mentioned a moment ago uh, about how in West Texas you're used to tough times, and I thought of uh, I had a mentor for several years, Robert Schuler, and, and he he had a statement that I just loved. He said, "Tough times don't last, but tough people do." And I, when, when, so when Colin, when you said that statement, I thought, boy, that you just described uh, West Texas. You know, you're tough people. 
And uh, you're going to make it through this uh, difficult time. I know you are. And uh, I want to just kind of begin my time with you today to talk to you, first of all, about how to lead. How, how, How do you lead well? During a crisis, and this this is going to be a really short introduction. It's not going to be long, but I think I need to put this in front of you because you've got to lead your family. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you if you have a, a business, even though you may not be able to be with them in proximity, you've got to lead teams, organizations, and, and so when when there's a difficult time, how do you and I lead well? And, and so let me just give you some real quick thoughts, thoughts that you're going to grasp and, and you know, kind of hold on to very quickly because they're simple, but they're just practical. They're going to help you. For example, in leading well during a crisis, especially when we think of the coronavirus, the number one is obviously, the number one priority is the safety of the people. So that's where we start. That's, that's, that's just absolutely the bottom line. The people that you're responsible for, the people I'm responsible for, more than anything else, we want them to, to be safe. We want to. We want to have them protected, and and that's why we're well, that's why we're socially distancing ourselves, and that's why we're doing everything we can to comply so that we can get through this crisis as quickly as possible. Because I do think there's a relationship between the compliance of social distancing, for example, and and probably getting through the crisis a, a little bit more uh, quickly. So it's always number one with the leader. The, f- the first thing a leader always asks himself or herself is, what's best for the people? How do I value the people? I was in Israel um, uh, really almost for the last month with Mark Cole. And, uh, of course, I've mentored him, and he oversees all of the Maxwell Enterprise. And, and he had some major issues to deal with, and one of them was we were getting ready. In fact, in, in just a couple of days in Orlando, we were going to have 3,000 people come for a large convention. Of course, obviously, as this crisis progressed, I watched him go through many steps of uh, as a leader. But what, I, what was most pleasing to me, because he's a very good leader, is that in spite of all the things that were happening, all the things that were shifting around him, he, there was one constant that he had. And this is what I don't want you to miss for yourself, myself, for all of us. And the constant Mark had was, what's best for the people? What's best for the people? Because he values people. And what's best for the people is for them to be safe. And so that's that's the number one priority. If you're, if you're leading, the first issue is, what's best for the people? How can I keep them safe? I would say the second thing, though, as a leader, if you're going to lead well in a, in a crisis, um, I think the second thing is is to educate yourself. And I think that we have to kind of stay on top of the coronavirus issue. And, and what I mean by that is you can't, you can't know everything. But when I say educate yourself, let me make, be real clear. When I talk about educating yourself, I'm not talking about watching TV and watching the news and the media. Okay? I'm not anti-media. I'm just telling you that you're not going to get the whole picture if you watch them. There's a lot of sensationalism. I mean, there's, it's, it, let's just put it this way. You don't have to really watch the the media as far as the social media and TV news. But I, I want to give you two places where you can go that are solid, that will give you information on this virus that you can be assured that it's not being politicized and it, and, and, and it's, 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 it's not coming through a, a a filter that is not going to help you. One is uh, the World Health Organization, uh, WHO, WHO is what's, what's known for. They have a daily situation report. And if you just go to that, every day they'll update you on, on what's really happening with the, with the coronavirus. And the other one is um, out of Atlanta, CDC, the, the Center for uh, Disease Control. They have a website. Now, I'm just giving that to you because I think that as a leader, you just kind of have to have the facts and and the true picture. And I think that those are two places where you can get maybe the clearest, truest, most realistic picture so that you can keep yourself updated and educated. So the safety of people, number one priority, priority, educate yourself. Number three is, is, is be flexible. And the reason you have to be flexible is because this virus issue doesn't change daily. It changes hourly. I mean, it, it's it, it, it's what was yesterday is already past, and it's old news, and, and something new and more current is happening. And so uh, I wrote a book, you know, last year called Leader Shift, and it's been a very successful book. And the reason it was successful was all about how to adapt yourself 
uh, to what's really happening. And, and, and what I'm talking about is, is that we all lost plan A, okay? I lost plan A, you lost plan A. I mean, you're at home watching me right now. I'm, I'm in a studio right now. We all lost plan A. I, nobody has plan A in their life now. And, and for some of us, we don't even have plan B. You know, plan B already fell by the wayside. In fact, again, going back to Mark and I being in Israel, I watched him over the process of about eight days. I mean, if I didn't know better, I'd think the guy couldn't make up his mind. Well, it's, he doesn't have a problem not making up his mind. It's, it's an issue. Everything kept changing. And what I'm saying to you is that this is where a leader shines. A leader shines when things are moving, when, when things are, are, are uncertain. And, and the reason for that is because the leader is willing to, in those uncertain moving parts, he or she is willing to constantly keep asking the question, what do I need to know now to lead my people best now? And what I knew yesterday, maybe it doesn't work right now. And, and, and I may have to go to plan C. And, and so I think it's important, leaders, to let your people know, your team know, that you're leading them out of the moment. And the only reason you're leaving now at the moment is that's all that you have. Now, leaders see more than others, and they see before others, but you always have to communicate in the moment what is. Now, you lead in the future, but you communicate in the moment. So be, be flexible, okay? N number four, I would encourage you to, you to utilize your team, or, or uh, maybe a better word is leverage your team. And, and what I mean by that is that many of you have teams. And I think that you need to bring them around you and, and get their input and ask questions. Um, it goes back to, you know, Kim Blanchard has been a great friend a lot of, for a long time, and, and he has a great statement. He says, none of us is as smart as all of us. And, and so when you, if you have people around you, if you have a team, um, get them in the game with you. They'll take ownership of it better and, and ask them questions. Uh, and and you, you really need different perspectives. Different perspectives are very healthy, again, especially in ever-changing, ongoing uh, situations. Uh, number five, and, and I think this one's really, well, in fact, when I wrote this down, in fact, this, I really, when I was getting ready for the, I, this morning, I, I got up early, and, and what I'm giving you right now, I just literally, a couple of hours ago, wrote down, but I think this one is really important, and, and that is uh, communicate, here's a big word, I'm going to explain it to you in a moment, judiciously more than continually. I don't think people need, if, if continual communication did it, we got enough communi continual communication. The media just is flooded with the, the coronavirus. So I, I, don't, I, I don't know we have to be constantly communicating, but I think we need to be judiciously communicating. And what that means, that we, when somebody is judicious, what that means is, is that they have, um, they have good discernment and they have good judgment. And, and what I mean by that is, is that we simply have to, as leaders, um, not say the thing that we want to say, but to say the thing that brings forth discernment, uh, experience, wisdom, uh, context, understanding. And I just think that that's just, I think that's just kind of huge for your life and for my life. And so there, there you go. You those are just five quick things that'll kind of maybe help you to uh, lead a little bit better during the crisis. So let's talk about the crisis, okay? Now, uh, I'm 73, so I've been through a lot of bad experiences, okay? And and you've been through some because bad experiences happen quite often. And and as Colin shared with you out in West Texas, you know, with the oil issue, I mean, you you not only have the the virus issue, you've got the oil price issue right now. But you're used to that. I mean, it, it's not like this is the first time that this has happened. And 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 to to a certain extent, when I'm talking to you today, I look at you as you're more experienced. You have an advantage over a lot of people, who maybe they don't get uh, as frequent bad. Uh, experiences in their life is is what you've had out in West Texas. But here's what I know about crisis and bad experiences. I know three things, and those three things, you know what? I know them. I'm going to share them with you, and you're going to know them. But when I tell them, you're already going to know that you knew them before I told you. I'm just bringing them right to the surface now. And number one is everyone has bad experiences. A crisis is no respecter of anybody. A crisis is a crisis, and the reason it's a crisis is because it includes all of us. We're all in the same boats. And, and, and you know, you know some, hey, some days you're a pigeon, 
Some days you're a statue. Right now, we are a statue. A crisis means I'm a statue and I'm getting pooped on, okay? All kind of stuff is happening in my life. It's happening in your life. We all have, we all have bad experiences. Now, I want us to see that because I, I think misery loves company. And I think I want us to see that because I want us to understand that nobody's getting by with something. It's just we all are part of this process. I can remember back in 2008 um, when we had the major financial collapse in America. And, and when I saw the, this happening, I realized that people were going to be looking for some kind of hope because we were all having a bad experience. And I can remember sitting down in my office and over about a three-day period, writing out a teaching that for the next 18 months, everywhere I went, people said, we want you to teach on this subject. I had a, I had a lesson called how to do good when things are so bad. How, how, do, you come out, how do you come out good when, when everything around you is kind of turning out bad? And it was, a, it was a very simple teaching that basically said, everybody is in a crisis. We all are in the same boat. But even though we're all in the same boat, we don't all have the same outcome. Now, this is huge. In other words, there are some people that they don't do good things when things are all bad. They do bad things when all things are bad and everything gets badder. And and we don't want that. You don't want that. I don't want that. So what? every one of us are in the same boat. We all have the crisis. That's the first thing. The second thing I want you to know is that nobody likes this. I've not run into anybody. Have any, I mean, Mark, Carl, have you guys, have you guys... I'm not running anybody that says, man, this is so exciting, the coronavirus. I mean, that's just, nobody likes this. So we don't need to take a poll. I don't need to ask, you know, what do you think? Everybody, we hate it. We don't like it. We don't like the uncertainty. We don't like the inconvenience. You know, I'm kind of like Lucy and, and, you know, and Charlie Brown and Peanuts. And she, you know, one time she said, I don't want ups and downs. I want ups and ups. Well, I kind of vote for ups and ups. How many, how many, okay, I know you're in your, maybe in your living room all by yourself or maybe with your family or a few friends. How many of you just like ups and ups? Okay, we all can raise our hands. In fact, I'll raise both hands. I want ups, I want ups and ups. But life is not that way. I don't get ups and ups. I, I get ups and downs. Now, when we're in the downs time, the question is, are we up or are we getting up? You see, we've all been knocked down. We're knocked down right now. The question is not, are we down? The question is, are we content to stay there and be the victim of this crisis? Or are we saying, hey, I don't belong here. I'm going to get back up. I I brought this along for a little humor because I think at this time we need a little humor. I've had this for some time. and I'm going to read it to you. It's my friend Chuck Swindoll did this. This is about about Chippy the uh, the parakeet. And I'm going to read it to you. Okay, just just sit back and relax for a moment. Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. Once, one moment he was successfully perched in his cage singing, and the next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. His problem began when his owner decided to clean his cage with a vacuum. She stuck the nozzle in to suck up the seeds and feathers on the bottom of the cage, and then the phone rang, and instinctively... She turned around to pick it up, and she barely said hello, and Chippy got sucked in, and she gasped. She let the phone drop, turned off the vacuum, and with her heart in her mouth, she unzipped the bag, and there was Chippy, alive but stunned, covered with heavy black dust. She grabbed him, rushed him to the bathtub, turned on the faucet full blast, and held Chippy under the torrent of ice-cold water, power-washing him clean. So she did what any compassionate pet pet owner would do. She snatched then the hairdryer up and blasted the wet, shivering little bird with hot air. Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. (laughs) Of course, of course, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. You have something like that happen, you just kind of say, "What happened?" And and that's kind of where we are. We kind of say, "You know, what happened? How how did this all come so quickly?" So when you think of the crisis and bad experience, everyone has them. No one likes them. But the third point is really what I want you to grab hold of. Some people make the bad experience 
become a positive experience, or at least a better experience. Warren Lester said, the success in life comes not from holding a good hand, but playing a poor hand well. I think that's very true, and I think that's what's happening to us right now. What a crisis means is we're playing cards. We all have bad hands right now. There, there's nobody that's got a bunch of aces. There's, there's nobody that's sitting pretty. We're looking at our hands, and we're basically saying, this is not a winning hand. And, and over the last, for all of us, over these last couple of weeks, everything's just changed almost, almost immediately. I mean, for me, if you would ask me the 1st of March what I would be doing in March, April, May, I'd say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking in Odessa, and, and I, I'm speaking, well, in fact, I'm going to Rome in, in, uh, in April and having a, 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 Pope Francis has asked me to teach a master class there with him, and I'm going to be three days in the Vatican teaching leadership to thousands of people around the world with the Pope, and I, I would have given you a list of my, <coughs> schedule, my schedule, my itinerary, the whole deal. Guess what? None of it's happening now. In fact, somebody called me the other day and they said, John, what are you doing? And I said, I'm making lemonade. That's what I'm doing. I'm making lemonade. You know, when you're handed a lemon, you know, what are you going to do with it? Well, go make some lemonade. And, and, and I want to tell you right now, in the West Texas area, listen to me, all of you, you need to go out and make some lemonade, okay? Just need to make some lemonade. <coughs> This cough, I've had for four weeks, okay? So I'm okay. I'm okay. It's just a little cough. Napoleon Hill said, every adversity, every failure, every heartache carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. Now, I love that statement. In other words, every crisis, right alongside that crisis, is a seed. And that seed is of equal or even greater positive benefit than the negative crisis. Now, I've always loved that quote by Napoleon Hill, but it's only true. If, if Napoleon Hill was alive and sitting around the table with me right now, I, I'd look at him and say, Mr. Hill, love the statement, but it's only true if you have the right perspective. That statement is not true with the wrong perspective. If I have the wrong perspective, there is no benefit out of a, out of a crisis. There, there's nothing good that comes out of something bad if my perspective is bad. You see, this lesson is about perspective. How we view things is how we do things. And if I view things in a negative way, I do negative things and have negative results. But if, if I view a crisis as a potential for a seed that has at least equal, if not a better benefit, all of a sudden, everything begins to change in my life. Now, I've written 80. How many books have I written? 86. 80, Mark, okay, Mark, Mark keeps count. I, I just keep forgetting. I, but I've written 86 books, okay? And the first book that I wrote, was clear back in 1979, and it was called Think on These Things. And the reason I wrote that book first is because I grew up in a home where my father understood the value of thinking correctly and a good perspective. And this was absolutely huge. And, and so I grew up with, and I'm a person of faith, and you know that, but I grew up with a passage of Scripture. In fact, if you ever get my book, you, I, I don't suggest you do this at all, okay? It wasn't that good of a book. It was my first book. But if you go to my first book, Think on These Things, you'll find Philippians 4, 8, and 9 in that book because the Apostle Paul said, summing it up, friends, I'd say you'll be best. You'll do your very best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. And then, so he wants to make sure we understand this. So he says, I want you to meditate. I want you to focus on the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Put into practice what you have learned from me, what you've heard, what you saw, what you realized. Do that. And he said, God will make everything work together for you in the most excellent way. You see, well, do you see what Paul advised all of us to do? He said he advised us to focus on positive things. Now, that's the challenge in a negative culture and in a crisis time. 
But Paul wanted us to put a positive perspective into a negative situation. So what I'm going to do now is is I'm going to give you some perspective principles, okay? Things that I am practicing right now in my life. And if you'll practice them in your life and if your team and your family, they'll practice them. I promise you, we'll, we'll see a silver lining in this crisis. So here we go. I'm, I'm going to give you, I don't know, maybe we'll see how much time I have, but I hope I hope I have half, maybe I can do a half a dozen. I hope I can. Well, yeah, let's go. Let's give it a shot anyway. Okay. By the way, before I give you these perspectives, let me just say one more time. It's so good to be with you. It really is. I, I, uh, I really missed not being able to come out there. Uh, it, there's something uh, that's beautiful about the community. Uh, there's something beautiful about uh, the reason why we come together there. There's something beautiful about Colin and his desire to uplift always the community that he serves and, and lives in and loves. And so I, I miss this. But I can tell you, even though I'm, I'm missing being geographically in proximity to you, I'm so thankful that we have this opportunity. It's it's wonderful through uh, through technology and media that that I can come and talk to you right now. And, and what I'm going to give you, I want you to write these things down because I will promise you, if I let's say I get through a half a dozen, I, I will promise you three or four of them, maybe not all six, but three or four of them are going to be just perfect for you. It's just it's just going to when you write it down, you're going to say, okay, that fits. I I can I can I can learn off that. So so let's get going. And and the, I'm not putting them in priority. Like number one is more important than number four. I'm just giving you a few. Well, here we go. Number one, the first perspective principle I want you to have is one that I teach constantly, and you've probably heard me say it before. And that is very simple. Everything worthwhile is uphill. Now, what I want you to understand in this teaching today is very simple. If there's no crisis, everything worthwhile is uphill. When things are going good, everything worthwhile is uphill. In other words, everything that you want, all of your dreams, all of your hopes, all of your desires, they're all uphill. You've got to climb to get them. Now, let me show you the difference since we're doing this visually. Let me show you the difference between this perspective without a crisis and the perspective with a crisis. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Without a crisis, everything worthwhile is uphill. With a crisis, everything worthwhile is uphill. It's just steeper. The climb is harder, but it's still uphill. It's uphill in good times. It's uphill in average times. And now it's it's uphill. The difference is we feel it in a crisis. The the crisis surrounds us until we say, "This, this this is an uphill deal. And as I was thinking and working on this lesson, this is a statement I just I just wrote this down two days ago, and it's a, it's a fresh statement. I, I've I've never taught it. I, I've never even written it down, but I wrote it down. and I thought this is going to work. You see, we are not given you and I. We're not given an overcoming life. We're given life so we can overcome. There's a difference between those two. If I'm given in birth an overcoming life, then. That's something that's going to be automatic for me. It's just going to, I'm just going to be kind of an overcomer because I was given an overcomer. No, no, no. I'm given life. Good days, bad days, good times, bad times. I'm given life that I can be an overcomer. You see, there's a wrong perspective that people have about life, and it's very simple. They think life should be easy. They, They basically think, that instead of everything being worthwhile uphill, they think that everything worthwhile ought to be level, or or maybe they could even it wouldn't it be wonderful. Wouldn't it be wouldn't it be wonderful if it was downhill and you and I could coast to our dreams, coast to our best efforts? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be amazing if we just we just you know put the baby in neutral and just woke up one day and all those things we wanted were there? You see, that's a wrong perspective. Life is not easy. It's never been easy. It's just even harder in a crisis. It's not supposed to be easy. 
When, when people hear me communicate sometimes, I say, well, John, you just seem to be a natural communicator. And, and I laugh and I say, you just have to understand, it took me 10 years to be a natural communicator, okay? I, I wasn't any good the first time. I, I, I sometimes wish, one of my biggest wishes is people, it, I wish I could go back when I was 20, 21, 22, and I started speaking, I wish you could hear me. You tr- trust me. If you'd have heard me at, if you'd have heard me as a young speaker, you would have never thought I would be where I am today. I never thought I'd be where I was today. My wife Margaret never thought I'd be where I was. My parents didn't think I. I mean, I, 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 the first time I spoke, I spoke for fifty-five minutes. It was totally boring, and I went back a year later to apologize to the crowd for the last time, and then I realized none of them that heard me the first time came back the second time. They had more sense than that. You, you see, everything worthwhile is uphill, whether it's whether it's speaking, when people say, well, John, you write all these books and millions of copies are sold. Can I tell you something? It took me five books to even learn how to write, and it, I, my books didn't even sell till my 11th book. Again, I just want you, everything worthwhile, it's all uphill. In my first book, Think on These Things, I have a chapter. It's a small chapter. It's only three pages. They're all small because I didn't have much to say back then. But it was on problems. And I've never forgotten when I wrote, I mean, I wrote this in 1979, and it's just seared in my mind because this is the way I see problems. The letter P stands for the fact that problems are predictors. Nothing predicts who we are and where we're going more than a problem because problems move us. They either move us positively or they move us negatively, but they move us. Problems don't allow us to say the same. They're predictors. The letter R is the fact that they're reminders. And what they remind me of is the fact that life is tough. It's not easy. It is uphill all the way. It's not supposed to be easy. And at Christ, it even gets more difficult. The letter O stands for the fact that there are opportunities. Every good thing that you and I experience today was birthed out of a problem. I mean, when you think, think of medicine. Well, right now, they're trying to, to be able to, to, to cure the coronavirus, and, and they're going to find a cure. Now, when are they going to find a cure, and why did they find the cure? They have to find the cure because there's an emergency here. There's a crisis here. So now they're finding a cure. It's the problem that led to the cure. It's the problem that led to the cure. Every time you take a piece, a, a, a tablet, every time you take medicine, just understand it all was birthed out of a problem. There are opportunities. In every problem, there's always an opportunity. The letter B is the fact that they're blessings. Every, every problem is a blessing. Now, we don't feel it now. I mean, okay, I, I'm not running around and running anybody to support this coronavirus. Woo, woo, what a blessing. What, no, no. Here's what you realize. In the middle of the storm, you're never excited about the storm. It's only when you come through on the other side, and then you begin to look at the lessons you learned, and you say, wow. Wow, I, I grew. In fact, let me just say this. We grow more in our struggles than we do in our ease. Yeah. It's, it's our struggles that refine us. It's our, it's our struggles that develop our character. They're blessings. And the letter L in problems is they're all lessons. Every problem has a lesson. The question is not, is there a lesson in the problem? The question is, will we learn the lesson? Will we be teachable? And by the way, problems are everywhere. Now, this is a global crisis, so I don't even need to dwell there. But, I mean, there's no person, no group, no country that is excluded from, from, from the potential of this virus. I got problems. You got problems. All God's children got problems. The letter M, all problems are messages. You know, when you, 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 you look at the, your, your car and every once in a while there will be an emergency or red light or something will signal, say, you, you know, got a problem here. Well, 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 problems are, are kind of the, just like the dashboard on that car. They just basically say, "Okay, we got a problem here. We, we, we've got to we've got to look at it. We've we've got to we've got to stop here. We can't ignore it." And the letter S in problems is they're solvable. Every problem is solvable. There is always an answer, which. Brings me to the second perspective. First perspective, everything worthwhile is uphill. Now, remember this now. In, a, in, 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 in regular times, the hill looks like this. During the coronavirus, the hill looks like this, okay? It's just a steeper hill, but, but it's still a hill, okay? The second perspective that I want you to have about crisis and, and, and bad things happening is this. There is always 
an answer. There's always an answer. Trust me on this. My name is John. I am your friend. There is always an answer. Now you say, John, how can you say that? Right now, we don't seem to have an answer for the coronavirus. I know that, but we will. We always do. When you look at all of the crisis that we've had health-wise in the world, all the things that happen, I mean, when you think, look at age, you look at SARS, I mean, you, when, there's always an answer. Someone will find the answer. Now, the fact that I know there is always an answer as a leader allows me to give hope. And the hope that I give is not based on pie-in-the-sky, unrealistic, positive thinking. It's hope based on the fact of experience. We've always found an answer. It's not always been easy. Sometimes it's not even fast. But we've always found an answer. And we'll find an answer again. And I want to, I want to encourage you You're either living on the other side of yes or you're living on the other side of no. And if you're living on the other side of yes, you're living in in, in kind of a a belief, faith perspective. You're living on the other side of no. You're you're basically controlled by your your fears in your life. And I just want you to know, you, you can live in either world. And by the way, if you live on the other side of no, you'll continually see more fear more negativism, and more reasons to validate why you think there's not an answer. Just as if you live on the other side of yes, you'll continually see things that will help you understand that there is an answer. You see, the greatest gap between people, between successful people and unsuccessful people, is the perspective gap. Trust me on this. Successful people live on the other side of yes. Unsuccessful people live on the other side of no. Successful people believe that there is always an answer, and unsuccessful people believe that there's probably no hope or answer. They become a victim. You see, I become a victim of whatever situation I'm in when I don't believe there's an answer. But the moment that I believe there is an answer, that pulls me out of that victim mentality and allows me to rise above all of the negative circumstances that surrounded me. So I'm going to read you this piece. I love this. This is, this is I want us to all be like what I call smart donkey, okay? I, I mean, just, I just want us to, to, to do this, okay? So let me, let me read you the story. It's a, it's a great story. It's a, it's a humorous story. One day, a farmer's donkey fell into a well. The animal cried piteously for hours as the farmer tried to figure out what to do. And finally, he decided the animal was old and the well needed to be covered up anyway. So it, it, it just wasn't worth whatever effort it would take to retrieve the donkey. So he invited all of his neighbors to come over and help him. They all grabbed a shovel and they began to shovel dirt into the well. The donkey realized what was happening and began to cry horribly. Then to everyone's amazement, the donkey quieted down. A few shovel loads later, and the farmer finally looked down the well, and to his astonishment, he saw that each shovel of dirt that had hit the donkey's back, the donkey let it fall off of his back, He would shake it off and he would take a step up. And as the farmer's neighbors continued to shovel dirt on top of the animal, he would shake it off and then step up on the dirt. Pretty soon, everyone was amazed as the donkey stepped out over the edge of the well and happily, he trotted off. Well, let me tell you something. We're getting dirt thrown on us right now. You can either let it bury you or you can let it help you rise to get out of the situation. It's your call. It's your call. And my name is John, and I'm your friend, and I'm just here to tell you the reason I'm on this call is I know that there are some of you, you're going to make a shift. You're making a shift right now while I talk. You're sitting there and saying, yeah, I I am getting dumped on here. But instead of being buried by all the stuff that could bury a person, I'm going to I'm going to shake it off, and I'm going to just keep stepping and stomping, and and I'm going to I'm going to keep I'm going to keep climbing. That's what I want for you. That's what I believe for you. 
In fact, that's why I'm here with you today is, is because I know there are many of you, you're just going to remember the smart donkey and you're going to go around. In fact, maybe you'll go around and somebody says, you know what? Just like I told somebody the other day I was making lemonade, you may go around and say, hey, I'm smart donkey today. Well, smart donkey means when stuff jumps on you, you just shake it off, stomp it down and rise up a few more inches until you get to where you want to go. Okay. Third perspective. This one, to be honest with you, for some of you, this perspective I'm about to give you, you're going to look back, I don't know, six months from now, a year from now, and you're going to say, boy, I'm glad I heard that because this was my breakthrough during this crisis. Perspective number three, allow adversity to help you to discover who you really are. You see, I am convinced that it's in adversity that we really discover who we are. And I can give you examples of that. I mean, I, well, I mean I, in fact, when I wrote that down, I, I began to think of how many times, how many times have I been in a crisis? And honestly, it was a wake-up call for me. I, I, for example, I, I started off, uh, you know, in, in the ministry as a pastor. And I had a counseling degree, and so I went to my first congregation, and I did a lot of counseling. I probably did, I don't know, not a lot, but maybe 12, 15 hours of counseling every week. Now, I'd been trained in counseling, but I had a problem, and that was I wasn't any good at it. I didn't enjoy it. Uh, it wasn't a strength of mine, and probably I wasn't helping that many people. And, and after about, after about a, I don't know, a year, year and a half, I just thought, I, this isn't working for me. This, this isn't who I am, and I know I've got a degree in it. But I, I don't, I'm, I, I just, I'm not challenged by it. I'm not invigorated by it. I, I just came to the conclusion I wasn't a good counselor. So I remember standing up in church one Sunday and just basically saying, you know what, I've been doing some counseling, and I've come to the conclusion I'm not very good at it. So I'm just not going to do any more counseling. Now, I had a little country church in southern Indiana. When I said that, those farmers, but by now they had been with me a year and a half, and they knew me well, and they knew I had a sense of humor. When I said I wasn't any good at counseling, two or three of them said, amen. And then everybody started laughing, and then they all started clapping. And the next thing I knew, they're they're on their feet. They're giving me a standing ovation. They're saying, "Oh my God, he's finally realized he's just not any good at counseling." And, and, and you know, and the reason I wasn't any good at it is because counseling is constantly trying to help people with their weaknesses. And within three months, I went from a counselor to an equipper. Now, equipping is helping people with their strengths. The moment I went to the equipping side and could help you with those strengths, I blossomed. I was so good at equipping. I was so terrible at counseling. But can I tell you something? I had to get bad before I had to get good. That's what a crisis does. A crisis helps us discover who we are. And sometimes that discovery is by failing, by coming short. And I just want you to know that bad things can turn into good things, and they can help us to discover who we are. When I At 51, I had a heart attack. It was a real crisis of health in my life. And I can remember when I came through that crisis in my life, the calling that I have and the passion and the mission that I have. People say at 73, they say, John, you've not lost any passion. You've not lost any focus. Well, of course I haven't lost any passion focus. At 51, I thought I lost my life. I thought it was over. And when I was given a second shot... I said, I'll never lose that passion. I'll never lose that focus. I'm now living on God's extra grace and borrowed time. You see, the crisis helped me to discover who I really was, even into a greater degree. Now, that you know that, that's getting a little heavy, perhaps. So let me read you. A, a, when, you, when, you when you're going to tell or read a corny story, you need to tell people it's corny before you read it so that you lower their expectations. But I, this, the, I love this story. It, it, it's about a, a young boy who was playing baseball in his front yard, and he announced to his mother, she's watching through the window, he said, Mom, I'm the greatest hitter in all of baseball. And so he threw the ball into the air, and he took a mighty swing with his bat, and he missed. And he said, that's strike one. 
but it's okay. I I I, I got two more strikes. I, I I'm the greatest hitter in baseball. So he tossed the ball in the air again, swung mighty, missed the ball. He said, oh, that's strike two, but it's not a problem. He said, because I'm the greatest hitter in baseball. So he threw the ball up once more. This time he swung so hard, he not only missed the ball, but he fell on the ground and the ball laid, <laughs> the ball laid, laid, laid right beside him, totally untouched. So he got up and he dusted off his pants and he cried out, strike three. He said, I'm out. And his mother called out, aren't you upset? You didn't get a hit. After all, you're the greatest hitter in baseball. And the boy turned and smiled and said, no way. He said, I just struck myself out. I've just discovered I'm the greatest pitcher in baseball. <laughs> you know, we may find out we're the greatest pitcher. We're going to, we're going to discuss. Some of you are going to discover who you really are in this process, trust me, and it's going to be absolutely exciting about what happens. Okay, you're doing good. I'm doing good. I'm excited. Thanks for thanks for being with me. Thanks for taking time out today to let me share with you. I, I want to give you the fourth perspective, and this one um, you can go to the bank on, okay? This one, if you'll just practice and live this, it'll be one of your best friends during a crisis. Perspective number four, develop a positive life stance. Now, a positive, let, let, me, let me explain what life stance is. It's, it's got to be positive, but, but let me explain life stance. Life stance is a consistent attitude that continually influences my behavior. A life stance is who I am every day. I, I carry a positive life stance which then influences every day how I see things, how I do things, how I respond. A positive life stance. In other words, it's a continuous way of thinking, living, that's, that has a positive makeup to it. So I'm going to give you these statements now. Listen carefully. Life is filled with good and bad. We all got that, right? Good, bad. I experience good. I experience bad. You experience good. You experience bad. There's no person that just experiences all bad. There's no person that experiences all good. Life is filled with good and bad. Number two, some of the good and bad I can't control. It's just life. In other words, I didn't bring the good onto myself. I didn't bring the bad onto myself. The, the coronavirus, we're in a crisis. I, there, there isn't anybody, I mean, there isn't any of us that brought this on. I mean, we didn't, we, we, we didn't do something stupid and have it happen to us. It, 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 it's, it's just a fact of life. The, the good and the bad, there are some things about good and bad you can't control. There are good things that happen to me I can't take any credit for. Bad things happen to me I can't, I can't blame myself. It's just life. Statement three. Some of the good and bad will find me. Trust me. No matter how positive I am, bad still finds me. A, a positive lifespan doesn't e exclude me from bad things happening. Bad's going to find me. Hey, good's going to find you. You may be negative, but you're going to have some good days. They're going to be, good will find you. Sometimes bad will find you. Statement four. If... I have a positive life stance. The good and the bad will get better. That's a fact. If I have a positive life stance, something that good happens to me gets a little hey, a little gooder. And, 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 if, and if I have a, a positive life stance, the bad stuff that happens to me gets a little bit better. In other words, a positive life stance upgrades the good and bad. Now, Number five, if I have a negative life span, so what, what happens when I have a negative life span? Well, here, I'll tell you what happens. The good and the bad will become worse. So if I have a negative life span, if something good happens to me, I'll diminish it. And if something, hey, just like if I have a positive life stance, the good gets gooder. When I have a negative life stance, the bad gets badder, okay? So number six, and here's the beauty. The sixth statement. 
Therefore, I choose a positive life stance. Now, why do I choose a positive life stance? It's very simple. I choose a positive life stance because I know that it makes the good better and the bad a little less hurtful. That's what a positive life stance does for me. Several years ago, I was in South Africa, and I had a real, a real honor. They, uh, the, in Robben Islands, where, where, where Nelson Mandela was in prison for so many years, unjustly, they offered to take me over. If, if, I, if I would take a news reporter with me, they offered to take me over and give me a private tour. No one else was on the island that day. And they had a, a fellow inmate of Nelson Mandela's who would be my guide, and they wanted me to see where he lived. And I was so honored to be able to go because I so greatly respect and respected Nelson Mandela. And so we went over to the island and, and met the, the, his fellow inmate. And, and and we spent two hours on that island where he was imprisoned. And I mean, I, I mean, his cell was eight by ten. He had a, a literally a, a little floor mat on the bottom for his bed, and 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 just a tiny little sink, a window no bigger than this with two bars in it that you could look out and basically see a a prison yard. I mean, when, when they when they when he, when they walk in, the first thing they do is they take away your name, and they never call you by name again in prison. You have a number. They devalue you, and and I, I, I remember when I was I, I spent a, probably fifteen minutes in that prison cell. I just asked if I could just be alone in there for a little bit. And I looked out the bar. I laid down on the mat. I I just went through all the motions I thought Nelson Mandela would do. And when I walked out, the the news reporter was waiting on me, and she looked at me. She said, "Well," she said, "You spent fifteen minutes in there." She I, she said, "What do you think?" And I looked at her and I said, "I think that in Nelson Mandela's life, you can't imprison greatness." Stick him in a little cell, put bars, take away his name. You can't imprison greatness. Make him work in a rock quarry in a cave. You can't imprison greatness. Well, what, what am I talking about? The reason he came out of that so well is he had a positive life stance. And he never let his surroundings control his spirit. And I just love that. I want that for you. I want that for myself during this crisis. Perspective number five, you're doing good. You're really doing good. I, you know, give yourself a standing innovation. I, I think you're just outstanding. I'm, 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 I'm excited to be sharing with you. And this one, this one's going to be huge too. Number five perspective, feed your faith and starve your fears. You see, we both have fear and faith within us. We both, we, and, and they never go away. It's, it's like some of you say, well, I've gotten rid of all fear. Well, I, I'll be honest with you. You haven't gotten rid of all your fears. You're on drugs. You're, you're delusional. You got issues, okay? We, we never quit. We, we always have a, a negative emotion. We always have positive emotions within us. And so somebody says, well, how do you feed faith? Or I mean, I guess, how do you? I suppose you could, you could feed fear too. How do you feed? Well, it's very simple. When I talk about feeding your faith, there's a word I want you to just write down right now, and the word is focus. You see, what you focus on expands. So if I focus on faith, guess what? Over time, faith gets bigger. If I focus on fear, guess what? Over time, fear gets bigger. By the way, I, I just saw a couple nights ago a survey. I put it in my notes for you today, and the survey was called, What is Troubling You? Okay? And, and here's what the survey said. 39% said financial issues were troubling them. 16% said job security. That was troubling them. And 12% said health. Wow, I mean, by far, those three things were by far the majority of things that are troubling you. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you. Oops, sorry. The survey was taken in 1992. Yeah. The survey wasn't taken last week. What I want you to understand is that if you have fears, I don't care what year it is, 1992, 2020, it's going to dominate your life. And so it's a whole issue of focus. You know, in the Cherokee Indians, they, 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 they were so good at 
transferring stories and legacy to the next generation. And, and uh, in, in the tale of two wolves, an old Cherokee Indian is speaking to his grandson. He says, two wolves are within you. One is evil and the other is good. And the grandson said, grandfather, which one will win? And the grandfather said, the one that you feed. If you either feed, if you feed your faith and focus on it, it'll win. If you feed your fears and focus on it, it'll win. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, listen to me. Don't feed the beast. Don't feed it. Focus on faith. Focus on the positive things that you can learn during this crisis. All right. One of my favorite stories. I love this story. Guy goes to the barber to get his hair cut. This is an old story. I used to tell this 20 years ago all the time. I haven't told it for a long time, but it fits here. Sits in the barber chair. He's all excited. He's a salesman, and he starts talking to Barbara. He says, well, he said, I, I'm going to Rome, Italy tomorrow. And he said, I've got a, a sales conference there, and I'm very excited. And, and, and he's, he's starting to kind of talk about his joy, and the barber stops him. And, you know, the, the barber is a fear pusher. He said, well, you, what do you mean you're going to Rome? And he, yeah, I'm going to Rome. He said, well, what airline are you going on? And tell him the airline. And he said, I wish you weren't going on that airline. He said, well, why, why, why do you wish that? Well, he said, it's just not a good airline. It's, their safety record's not good. They're never on time. And, and he said, oh, I, I just wish you were going on another air carrier. And so the salesman said, well, he said, I, I was going to do a sales conference over there. Oh, he said, oh, my gosh. I wish you weren't doing that. He said, you know, Italians will talk all day, but they're, they're not going to buy anything from you. He said, where are you staying? The guy told him the hotel. He said, well, you know, I was in Rome for six months. He said, let me tell you, that's a terrible hotel. He said, he said you'll be lucky to have service in there. He said, it's a terrible hotel. And you're going to go over there and try to sell those Italians. And by this time, this barber had just discouraged the salesman so bad that he's just kind of quietly sitting there. And now, now no, he's lost all of his joy. He's lost all of his enthusiasm. And he's just kind of muttering to himself. And the barber can hear him saying something about the Pope. He said, what, what did you say about the Pope? He said, well... He said, I don't know if I want to tell you now. He said, well, he said, I, I was hoping while I was over there that I'd have an audience with the Pope. The barber said, oh, this is getting so ridiculous. He said, wrong airline, wrong hotel, wrong reason for going. And, and a Pope isn't going to see somebody like you. And by the time he's done cutting his hair, he's just cut off all his joy. A month later, the salesman comes back in the same barber chair, sits there, and the barber says, well, how, how'd it go? How, how'd your trip to Rome go? Oh, he said, it was amazing. He said, you know that airline you told me that was a terrible airline? He said, we took off on time. He said, I laid my seat back. He said, I had one of the best rests. He said, we landed 20 minutes early, perfect landing. They picked me up, and I went to that hotel. You know that hotel you told me wouldn't give me? He said, I, honestly, he said, when we pulled up and, and I, I got out of the cab, he said, literally, as I, they were getting my luggage, he said, there was somebody out there, and they greeted me, and they handed me my towels, fresh towels. They had, and I had a balcony, and I overlooked the Vatican. It was just absolutely amazing. And I, he said, I went to my sales thing the next day, and by noon, I sold out all my wares. In fact, i got to go back next month. It was the best sales convention I ever could have. And and and, and the barber, he's, you know, it's fear pressure. Just, he can't handle all this good news. <laughs> he's kind of staggering there. And, and he said, but the best thing of all, he says, i gotta, I got to see the Pope. And the barber said, you're kidding me. You are kidding. You saw the Pope. He said, I don't know anybody that ever saw the Pope. You saw the Pope. I saw the Pope. I had a private audience with the Pope. Oh, my God. He said, tell me about it. Tell me about it. He said, well, he said, honestly, he said, they brought me into this incredibly ornate room. And I walked through the door, and I looked, oh, I would say uh, 40 feet away from me was the Pope standing there, just nodding for me and asking me to come. And he said, I just slowly, humbly walked that red carpet, feeling so unworthy to be in the presence of the Pope, and I finally got to where he was, and I quickly knelt in his presence and kissed his ring, and I, I said, Your Holiness, Your Holiness, I'm so honored. And he said, the Pope just put his fatherly hand upon my head and said, My son, oh, my son. <laughs> Who gave you that lousy haircut? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that story. I love that story. Be careful. Feed your faith. Come on. Feed your faith. 
Can I give you one more? I, 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 I've been, okay, just, up, can I just do one more? I, I promise you six, I gave you five. Let me give you this one and, and then we're wrapping it up. Number six is, is, um, now this is what I love about this one. This is so practical. You can do this. In fact, you can do this today. In fact, if you're in a room with someone else, you look at them right now and say, you can do this today. You just tell them that right now. You can do this today because I'm telling you, you can't, I can do it. You can do it. Colin, you can do it. Mark, you can do it. We can do it today. Here it is, number six, realize that motions influence emotions. Now, that's not something that I am smart enough to come up with, but the great psychologist George Crane said in his famous book, Applied Psychology, he said, remember, motions are always precursors of emotions. Now, our emotions, we don't have a lot of control over those. But our emotions, we can control every one of those. So here's what Dr. Crane said. I love this. If I feel, that's the emotions. If I feel something, if I feel, then he put, I love, the, I love this expression. It, it rhymes. It, it works. It'll stay with you. If I feel, then I will. So if I feel an emotion that's negative, then I will do a motion that's positive. Because the motions control the emotions. But if we don't take actions, the emotions control our lives. That's why fear paralyzes people. So here's what Dr. Crane said. If I feel depressed, what am I going to do about that? That's a negative emotion. He said, I will sing. That's emotion. How do I get rid of the depression? By singing. If I feel sad, I will laugh. If I fear, if I feel fear, I will express faith. If I feel poverty, I will think of wealth. If I feel incompetent, I will remember a past success. If I feel insignificant, I will remember my goals. Today, I will become the master of my emotions. I think this is absolutely huge. In fact, one of the things I love about doing this lesson with you today is this gives me a positive outlet during a crisis. And, and, and one of the reasons why you're watching me today is it's a positive exercise in a crescent, in, in a crisis. So when I, when, when I feel, then I will. When I feel the emotion that is depressing and down, then I will do something that is positive. I, I will counteract it. And remember, the motion will eventually control the emotion. But if you don't take motion, action, The emotion will control you. So my last thought is very simple. Um, Successful people have what I call a quick recovery time. And, and, And what I mean by that is during adversity, successful people recover from the negativity of the crisis quicker than others. And, and, and so you say, well, okay, if recovery time is so key, in fact, I, I tell my team all the time, you got 24 hours. When something bad happens to me, groan, moan, but, but, but by the way, you can't moan and lead at the same time, by the way. But anyway, groan and moan, but in 24 hours, take a positive action, get over it. Now, again, people that do well in life, their recovery time is shorter, and here's why. When they have a negative emotion, they more quickly instill a positive action. And that shortens that recovery time. See, recovery time is determined by how long it takes you to have a positive action on a negative emotion. So I want to encourage you as I wrap this up and I call up Mark and Colin to be with us, I want to encourage you today, do something that is a positive action that will help you replace that negative emotion. Six perspectives that'll just help you get through this crisis in a better way. And remember this, how we view things is how we do things. Perspective isn't something, it's everything. My name's John and I'm your friend and I hope this helped you because I did it just for you. Because I love you and I love Colin And I love coming 
to West Texas. So, Colin, how about you and Mark coming on up here? And uh, I guess we're going to have a little social distance here, <laughs> right? Social uh, distancing going on. Okay. How are we doing, gang? Huh? Good. So, first, thank you all for joining, for being part of this morning. We're going to take the next half hour and try to answer uh, some questions that have been sent our way. And then also some questions that uh, I know that Mark and I want to ask John as well. So, John, thank you. We really appreciate you. That's thank my you. joy. Thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah. So, John, yeah, I, I got to tell you, I, I got to tell you, um, I'm sitting back here in our studio in mm-hmm. Florida, and I'm taking insane notes because yep. like so many of you watching, um, I'm leading in a way right now that there are no models. I mean, John, you're mentoring me, you're helping me, but none of us have ever led like this. Mm -hmm. And that lesson, not only saturated with hope, but with a real sense of practical ways that we can lead in this is very impacting me. So thank you. I don't know what everybody from Odessa, Midland, West Texas showed up for because that lesson was obviously just for me. Oh, it's for me. me. (laughs) Hey, let me, Colin, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I, I today and last night got to spend time with these two leaders, and we we adhered to everything the CDC and local governments are telling us. But I got some time with both of you last night and then this morning, and uh, I'm a better leader for it. I'm a better leader because I was around leaders. You know, I had the follower film on me. I, I, w- I was thinking of all the problems, the complexities that, that are real that I need to be thinking about, but I just needed my perspective lifted, and you guys both did that. Thank you very much. That's what you're doing today. Colin, right. I want to ask you a question. Sure. So you're, you're leading at a way in a place you've never led before, you've never led in this place before, and you've got to have that leadership perspective. How do you balance the tension of a leadership perspective and empathy for the people that can't see the things that you can see? Yeah. That's a great question. So this morning, John and Mark and I were having breakfast, and and John reminded me of a quote that he's shared multiple times that I believe is from Max Dupree. And Max Dupree said that the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. Yeah. The second piece that Max Dupree said, and then offer hope. And the third piece we added to that statement mm-hmm. this morning was to take action. And so I would think that the, for what I had to do is to define reality. And what I've said to many people in our community and in our region is that we basically have a broken arm yeah. in West Texas, and we have a compound fracture right now. And the compound fracture is the coronavirus. It's what everybody can see. But we have a second break, and that's called the price of oil and gas, wow. that we don't fully understand the ramifications of because everybody's trying to fix the compound fracture first. So I have to define reality for my team. We also, uh, part of, of offering hope starts, in my opinion, with offering hope to myself. Yeah. And so um, all of the three of us here and, and are men of faith, and very specifically faith in Christ. Right. And I'm reminded of the quote that Martin Luther said, uh, and I paraphrase, that he had so much to do today that he would f- spend the first three hours in prayer. Well, And so I will tell you the first step that I've had to take to be able to provide hope for the people on my team and in our community is to look at hope from God. Beautiful. And then the next thing we've had to do is absolutely take massive action. We've had to say to people that, that in spite of all the problems that we have, we still have to have a faithful plan that takes action, that encourages people and give them a reason to really get up in the morning. So for me, Mark, it has been understanding that I absolutely have to know the reality. I've got to break. I've got to make sure that daily I provide hope to myself so that I can go out and provide hope to the people who are really counting on me. And as a leader, let me say, you and I don't have the luxury of not providing hope. Hmm. Because if as leaders we lose hope, everything's lost. Everything's over. Wow. And so, John, it's what you've said forever, that everything rises and falls on leadership. And that probably today in this world is more true than ever. Yeah, I, I'm reminded of in the Chicago fire call it, uh, a, a businessman, his his building burned down. Mm-hmm. And the next day he went out with a chair and a table 
and he put a sign on there and it said, all lost except family and hope. Mm. Well, wow. I love it. It's, you know, it, it, you know, as long as he's got that, he's, he, he, he can rise again, can yeah. he? That's sure. exactly. Right. So, so talk to me, and one more time to you, Colin. I got something sure. I want to ask John, and then we'll get to another no, question. Got, but talk to me about visibility. Mm-hmm. So, right now in Midland, Texas, <coughs> in West Texas, yeah. I mean, right now we're wondering all the leaders that were screaming and pub- being publicized, and, right. and three months ago, four months ago, are those leaders still there? And don't don't let me get you on a soapbox. Sure. But my real question <coughs> to you is, how do we respond? Even in my case. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I'll go to my back to my phone right after this webcast, and uh, I'll have more news about something else that's happened, something else that's canceled. Right. How do you work hard to stay and remain visible in difficult times? Well, I think that, number one, uh, you have seen, at least on my team, that I've been more visible than I've ever been. I mean, whether it's at our Ford store in our cafe, I'm walking through our cafe thanking people for being there, obviously in a respectful and an honoring manner. Uh, But every day we are having team meetings, either in person or on a conference call, just like I experienced you having this morning, because we have a responsibility to connect our people because people don't have bad years, bad months, or bad weeks. They have bad moments that were created by a bad thought that turns into a bad hour that results in a bad day. So at any given moment, my responsibility is to help people. Think about it this way. When all of us were little kids, and our moms and dads were trying to get our attention and we weren't paying attention. Very gently, my mom would take her hand and she would lift my chin so that I would look her in the eye. Uh, yeah. And so what I would encourage all of us as leaders, as people in our community is we need to lift the chin of the people in our homes and in our businesses. I like Remind that. Them. Water too. <laughs> because like that. every person wants this question answered, am I gonna be okay? Yeah, that's right. Good stuff. And and I think that we have to understand that is absolutely we're going to be okay. Is this a different problem? Have we ever encountered this problem? No. But Mark, what I always go back to, and John, you alluded to this, is that I always go back to if all of you will take the darkest moments you've ever had in your life, and you just go there for just a second, if I could sit you right on the front side of that dark moment and ask you the question, are you going to make it? Your question or answer probably is, I don't know. I don't know. But on the back side, that's right. Guess what? You made it. Yep. In 2009, did we think we were going to make it? After 9 11, did we think we were going to make it? No. Oh. And we're here. And I think that's what we have to remind ourselves of are the tragedies we survived when in the moment, we didn't think we could make it. That's a great thought. I yeah. love that. John, I'd love to ask you a, a quick question. You're talking with leaders while we were, uh, you, by the way, thank you. He jumped on our Zoom call today and spoke and encouraged our leaders that are in the trenches That's right. dealing with news every day. And thank you. That's what a real leader does, carves out some time and does that. And you did that today. While we're at breakfast, you get a FaceTime call from another global leader, a leader that is impacting thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on a monthly basis. And um, you're seeing the response of these leaders. Talk to me about, one, what are you seeing that real leaders are doing right now? Maybe some tangible examples or an attitude. And then do you still believe that everything rises and falls on leadership? Will we get out of this because of leadership? We will get out of it because of leadership, and I do still believe everything rises. Here's the difference. Crisis exaggerates everything. And what I mean by that is, in a crisis, if you're a bad leader, you just fall faster. Mm. It, crisis mm. always puts the camera on us. Mm. When, there's a, when, 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 when there's a crisis, Mark, um, good leadership shows up or bad leadership shows up. And when you ask the question, he, he was talking about Chris Hodges. I don't think Chris would mind me mentioning him, who is a, 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 a pastor in Birmingham <laughs> and uh, has a huge church, second largest church in America, mm-hmm. probably averages 60,000 attendance. And, and uh, of course, you know, they're shut down. I mean, they're not allowed to have those kind of gatherings right now. 
So he, he FaceTimed us today, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm with Chad, Mark, and Colin, and of course he knows all of us, and so we had kind of a leadership discussion. And then he said, uh, he said well, let me tell you what I'm doing during the crisis. He said, uh, I've given our whole parking lot as a place where people can come and, 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 and they can get checked out. Wow, for the coronavirus. Yeah, for the coronavirus. And, and, and I thought, now here's a, here's a, a huge parking lot. You could put thousands of cars That's in this right. parking lot. And he's basically saying the cars have, the, the parking lot's available. Come on over. We'll, we'll check you out, see if you have the virus or not, let you know. Mm -hmm. And he was turning it into an incredible community project. Yeah. And then remember, he showed us a picture, guys. Yeah. And it's a parking lot with it's full. hundreds yeah. and hundreds of <laughs> Thousands of cars. Maybe more full than his last weekend. Yeah, probably, oh, definitely yeah, probably, than his probably, last weekend. Probably right? more full yeah, than his yeah. last weekend. Yeah. But here's but the point being, what did he do? Instead of feeling sorry for himself and say, well, you know what? We probably yeah. won't maybe have a church service That's here right. for the next three or four weeks. He said, okay. Let's quit feeling sorry for what's happening, and let's do something that's positive. I'm going to I'm going to give I'm going to give the city of Birmingham my facilities and my place, and they can come and they can test people for the coronavirus. That's what leaders do. Awesome. Leaders step up and do something that alleviates the problem. Leaders lift people. That's right, and Mark, they show up. Boy, they yeah, show up, don't absolutely. they? Absolutely. Mark, you used a phrase earlier: the followers film. Yeah. So I know that you don't mean anything negative about it, but there is definitely a difference in perspective from a leadership view and a follower's view. Could you talk some about that? Yeah, I'd love to. So, uh, and, and what I meant by that is for, for days now, a couple of weeks, John, we have seven companies that are becoming one, multi-million dollar companies, and, and we're trying to march to the same beat of a drum. We just implemented this new strategy. And so we're learning we're learning each other as a new team, yeah. as well as dealing with something no team has ever dealt with. And so for the last several weeks, really, but for sure the last four or five days, I have been managing, and I want you to talk about the difference between managing and leading. I have been managing this crisis. I've been managing our response. I've been in the trenches as I should be as the leader, managing what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, being much more reactive than John teaches me as a leader to be. Leaders love to be proactive. Right now, all of us are in a reactive mode. And so I've just been managing, yeah. uh, Colin, and what I meant was no distinction That's between right. leaders are superior, followers are having yeah. a problem here. It was the fact that I have, maybe it's the manager's film. Yeah. Maybe it was this, this, this responsibility that I don't shirk. In fact, it's defining me, and I love it. But it's this management mentality that I've had. And then I got in this room last night and this morning, and I was, I was given permission to think like a leader, to look to the future, to begin leading with my thinking, not just managing with my thinking. And it just kind of took this, shield, this film off of me. And I came to the guys this morning and I said, I got to tell y'all, I had the best night's sleep. I had the best thinking that I've had in several weeks this morning because you guys gave me permission to think about leading more than to respond mm -hmm. by managing. Do you want to say a little bit about managing and leading? And well, like this? Yeah, well, I'd be glad to. And it's very simple. You can't manage yourself out of a crisis. You, you see, Amen. <laughs> the thing that managers love is predictability. They love familiarity. Yeah. They, they love to be able to say, you know, I got this down. I, I, I mean, I've got this all square. It, I, boy, I got this just right. right. They love that. Well, a crisis is a tornado to familiarity, to, to all those things that managers love. All of a sudden, everything's in the air. Everything's yeah. gone. It's destroyed. And their world is lost. Their world is lost because they base their decisions on things that they know, understand, and do. That's right. Mm. What does a leader do? A leader looks around and says, okay, I'm going to have to find another way. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've, got to, I've got to climb out of the pile, and I've got to look around, and I've got to get the right perspective. I've got to get the total context, and i got to take action. Yeah, Because you don't think your way out of a crisis. You don't even hope your way out of a crisis. Mm -hmm. You walk your way out of a crisis. Right. You, you work your way out of a crisis. There is no victory without action. Yeah. You know, my, my dad used to give me this little parable of the five frogs on a log. And I would be a little kid. He said, John, five frogs on a log and four decide to jump off. 
how many frogs are left? I'd say, well, one. He said, no, five. He said, just because you decide to do something doesn't mean you did it. Oh, wow. And, and, and so <laughs> in, a, in a crisis, it's more than good intentions or this is what I think we should do or what do you think about it and having conversation. It's somebody standing up and saying, okay, I'll take action. And I think the challenge for leadership is always we take action many times on things that we're not certain on ourselves. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the luxury of certainty in a crisis. If there was certainty in a crisis, it wouldn't be a crisis. So we have to take the step of uncertainty and be bold and courageous and say, I think this is the way to do it, but it may not be. But if it isn't, I'm going to back out of this as quickly as I can. I'm going to go over here to plan B. But what I am going to be doing is I'm going to keep knocking on the doors. I'm not going to be sitting back saying, I wonder what's behind that door. I'm going to go find out. I'm well, take Co action. Colin, you did yeah. that less than a week ago. Today's Thursday. Right. Friday of last week, I'm in the JFK airport flying back from Israel with John. Yeah. Sure. And me and you get on the phone mm -hmm. and you go, Mark, I don't have a, a challenge with our government telling us not to have this event yet. Now, today you look like a genius because that's what everybody has done. <laughs> but a week yeah. ago before everybody said it, you said, Mark, I've got a challenge on my hand. I don't think I can, I can with good integrity, still plan to have this meeting today in Odessa, Texas. Right. You're leading right here. That's right. You go, but hey, not doing anything is not an option. That's correct. I, I can't have these people that need leadership right now more than ever. Mm -hmm. I can't have them not have any leadership at all. What'd you do? You jumped on a plane. You came, picked me up. You got on a plane, got down here to get John. Right. Our team put together cameras and made That's this happen correct. where Colin could still add value to West Texas. That's what a leader does. Didn't think about it. You didn't say, well, let me let me spend a few hours. Let me fin spend a few days, Mark. You went, I think I need to cancel, but I got to do something. And we started planning this six days ago when you knew you needed to have an alternative. Absolutely. And my decision, I was determined, would be made out of faith and wisdom, not fear. Yeah, absolutely. Because fear-based decisions always run. And faith and wisdom-based decisions always stand tall. And I tell you That's what good. else we're going to do is next Wednesday, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Ray Perryman, who is a Nobel-nominated economist, is going to do a very similar event to this for all of the same people good. in West Texas to talk about the virus and oil production and what it looks like, not just for our region, but the world. Wow. Can and I get so, on that too? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I'm not speaking, but yeah. I, I want to watch yeah. that. Well, that's Absolutely. next Wednesday. Do It'll you have a time next yet? Wednesday at 9 a.m. Central. 9 a.m. So we'll be sending Central the link time. out to everybody. Awesome. And then, and then my commitment is this is not the new way we're going to do the Sewell Leadership event. This happened to be <laughs> this way at this time that we're going to do yeah. it because we still want it to be. Of course. Of course. Right. I mean, in fact, let me just say something because I, I don't want you to miss this. Colin's very disappointed because he had an ideal for you. In his mind, he had us all coming together in Odessa and ha having a terrific... That's He's right. very disappointed. Let me tell you something. Leaders take action out of their disappointment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can either take that disappointment and lay down. That's right. Or you can take that disappointment and say, okay, what's plan B? This is plan B. He'd still rather be in Odessa. You would, hey, you would, hey, we'd all rather not have the virus. We'd all rather be there. Right. But, but we're not, and we're not going to be. So now what are we going to do? Are we going to moan and groan? Or we're going to get plan B and have a Find good time else. with you Absolutely. today That's via right. this. That's right. John, I have a question for you. So you've given a lot of great advice for people of what they should do. Do you have any thoughts on the couple of mm -hmm. things that sometimes I don't know what to do, but I know exactly what I should not do? Yeah. Any thoughts on when you think about leading through this at a time that people should make sure they don't do? Yeah, three things. Number one, uh, you should not allow yourself to follow the crowd. Um, to be honest with you, in times of crisis, I kind of look where everybody's going and I basically say, I'm going to have to go the other way because they're all going and following their fears. And that's, that's not, that's not the trip wow. you want to take. Wow. So, th so the first thing you, you, you got to do is you got to just do a check on yourself. The second thing is don't put fuel to the fire. I mean, you're going to be around all kinds of people talking about how That's bad right. it is. Can, can I tell you something? How long do you need to discuss how bad it is before we all feel like going to a bridge and jumping off? 
I mean, right. <laughs> I've never known I've never known that's a right. negative discussion to turn out good. I I've that's never correct. I've never said you know right. we want to give negativity two hours. I think yeah. we need to give it four. <laughs> and, 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 and and I just that's think right. maybe in four hours. We'll be able to pull ourselves out. No, yeah, we won't yeah. be pulling ourselves right. out. Right. We'll be putting ourselves under. That's so, right. so, 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 don't go there. Don't, you know, buck the trend. Uh, when, right. If somebody around there is doing that, say, well, look, I just, you know, tell them what you just watched here, and and I don't know if it's linked so they can get on it or not. But 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 become a become a light and become a light in, in in darkness. And number three, take action. Every one of you today should do something positive in a negative environment that'll just make you feel better Mm -hmm. about who you are and the little bit of light that you turned on for somebody else. Can I say a couple of things? Absolutely. And this all comes from John. In fact, anything you hear me say comes from John, unless it's bad, and then it came from me. But um, I'll I'll tell you a couple other things that that I don't want us doing. I do want you socially distancing, a word that I had not even heard of a week ago. I want you doing that. But you know what I don't want you doing? Emotionally distancing. That's good. I don't want you relationally dis- dis- distancing. You still need to have a relationship. You know, I read just just while John was speaking, sorry, I was taking notes and reading, that Netflix and the European Union are trying to figure out what to do because everybody's watching so much Netflix that it's crashing the Internet in Europe. Mm. Don't sit and fill your mind with entertainment as if there's not something that we need to do. We need to get out and do something. I challenged our team the other day, Colin, just another moment, that there's three things I want you to do, our leadership team. I want you to recognize responsibility. We still have a responsibility to lead. John, you didn't bring us this far with a leadership brand for us to all of a sudden check out and say, well, we don't have to lead anymore. We're being led. No, there's still a leadership need in the world, recognize responsibility. The second thing I told him was to empathize with your people. I won't tell you the third, it doesn't matter. Maybe we'll do another webinar. But on empathize, it goes back to what do you want them not to do? So many times as leaders, we need to empathize with our people because we see more and before. Ever heard that before, John? We feel more and before. We think more and before. We do more and before. That's a leader's responsibility. And we get so far out that we think we're leading, but we're merely taking a hike because nobody's following. Empathy balances us. It, give us, it gives That's us good. that tension. But That's here's good. what empathy doesn't mean, and this is what I don't want you leaders to do. Empathy means walk a mile in somebody following you in their shoes, but it doesn't mean stay in their shoes. Take their shoes off once you're done empathizing with them. Put your leadership shoes back on Absolutely. and begin to lead. Understand, empathize, but so many times we think in moments like this, empathizing mean that means that we're paralyzed yeah. from action because we need to just feel the emotion. Don't get overwhelmed with empathizing to the point that you lose your responsibility to recognize leadership. That's very good, Mark. Very good. You must have a terrific mentor. I do, you. <laughs> and Colin, both of you guys. Oh. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Let me say one thing, and then I'm going to turn it to you, John, to close out. Um, But I had a young lady come to my office just earlier this week, and she was really, really concerned because one of the restaurants, as many restaurants have had to do, had had to go to curbside only. Mm. And this young lady began to weep. And she said, I'm not worried. I'll be okay. But she said, I work with five single moms. Yeah who don't know how they're going to pay rent and who don't know how they're going to feed their children tonight. Yep. And as I was leaving work just the other day, I felt kind of just placed on my heart. Uh, I went to the bank and I got quite a bit of cash. And I went to two restaurants in particular and I walked in and I knew the managers and I said, hey, here's X amount of dollars. I don't know who needs it the most, but you do. Give it to who everybody needs it. This morning, when we were at breakfast, the restaurant we were in, I went to the guy and I said, how many people are working here today? And he told me, and I gave him the money, and I said, just whatever you need. Isn't that beautiful? Now, that's beautiful. I'm not saying that because I want the recognition, but there are those of us, there are those of us who have been blessed far beyond 
anything we know what to do with. That's right. And in Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs says that when the righteous are blessed, the city rejoices. <laughs> and my hope right now is that for the Permian Basin and for the world, those of us who are able would truly go and be the hands of Jesus to people who aren't. And, wow. and those are the people that the city rejoices for, because the question is not, will you and I be generous in good times? The question is, will we be generous in times when we might lose it all? Wow. And for me, folks, that's hope. That's beautiful. And that's faith. Well, that's putting action behind your faith. I mean, it's one thing to say, boy, I feel sorry for people. It's something else to go do something about it. It's interesting. I didn't know you did that. I did see you leave uh, uh, our table for a moment. And and I did, but I didn't know what you were doing, Colin. But it was so interesting because two days ago I said to myself, when I go to restaurants, I tip a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Just just it's, it's just because of this right here. Wow. You just yes, sir. you just cover it. You just you know what That's I mean. Right. Just you just cover it and bless it. And uh, and I was at one a couple of days ago and did that. And and uh, when I walked started walking toward the door, the 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 single mom caught me. Yep. She said, you have no idea. Right. I, she said, I was wondering. I was wondering how I was going to feed my two kids. Wow. Yes. And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm glad I could help. And I just gave her another 100 bucks. I said, now, <laughs> feed, now, 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 right. now feed them for a few more days. But I, right. I, think, I think for all of you, and and, and don't have hundred dollar tips. Please, please don't don't hide behind a hundred dollar tip. I see, sometimes people say, well, I can't do that. If you can't do that, doesn't matter. Okay, you can do something. Right. You can do that. The whole That's key right. is. Don't ever let what you can't do keep you from what you can do. And, and our hope for this day, I know yours, Colin, is to just add value to the, to the people of West Texas and, and say, we're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. We're going to make it. We're going to make it together. We're not going to make it individual. We're going to make it together. And I hope this has just been something that's, uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you kind of finish this, I just hope you have a, a little bit more of a spring in your step and a little bit more of a song in your heart. Because we did our best today to add value to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank and you. Thank you, much. Colin. Yeah. Thank you, Colin. You're the one who cares for your community. Yeah. The only reason I'm here, Marcus here, is because Colin cares for you. And I love him for that. And I love you. Thank you. <laughs>